And with that, I will hand things over to Tanya. Thank you. Thanks, Dan. Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us for part of your evening. I'm Tanya Isa. I'm a member of the board of the Rensselaer Plateau Alliance. And we hope this will be an enjoyable, informative evening for you as we learn about how deer affect our woods. Before introductions, we will acknowledge our relationship to the land that we aim to conserve. It is with gratitude and humility that we acknowledge that we are learning, speaking, and gathering on the ancestral homelands of the Mohican people, who are the indigenous people of this land. Despite tremendous hardship in being forced from here, today their community resides in Wisconsin and is known as the Stockbridge Muncie community. We pay honor and respect to their ancestors past and present as we commit to building a more inclusive and equitable space for all. Now, it is my pleasure to introduce our speaker. We are lucky to have Christy Sullivan with us tonight. She is the co-director of the Conservation Education and Research Program in the Department of Natural Resources at Cornell University. She works with private forest landowners, land managers, natural resource professionals and educators to encourage and support practical approaches to conserving wildlife and biodiversity for current and future generations. Christy also directs the New York Master Naturalist Volunteer Program. To complement her extension program, her research focuses on developing practical methods for managing and restoring forest habitats and determining effective means for sustaining and conserving native wildlife in the face of environmental change. Welcome, Christy. We're looking forward to your presentation tonight. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tanya. And uh, what a great group. We have a pretty big group and I am grateful that you all would spend some time this evening. Um, I am gonna talk to you about how deer affect your woods and I think you know, some people might have uh, already have quite a bit of uh, background information on this issue, but hopefully I'll be able to share some things that are, are new for you. And I know that um, it's something that I continue to, to learn about. So uh, we'll get started. So today I'll, I'll talk a little bit about the condition of New York's forests, so where we are today. Um, I will talk about how deer affect our woodlands, uh, some specifics. And then I'm going to talk to you about a, a citizen science pr program called AVID, Assessing Vegetation Impacts from Deer, and uh, how you might uh, get involved if you wish to. Okay, so what makes a healthy forest? And there are many, many things that can make a healthy forest, but generally speaking, I'm going to say that a healthy forest contains a variety of native plant and tree species. And it also has an abil the ability uh, for a new forest to grow, or you may have heard the word regenerate. Uh, in the case of disturbance, and that could be either a natural disturbance, like a, a, wind a wind throw, or it could be an ice storm, or it could be intentional management um, or an intentional disturbance caused by a timber harvest. So back in um, 2010, the Nature Conservancy um, had a project where they looked at the ability for um, their native tree canopy species to regenerate in New York State. And they did, they did some modeling and they projected where we might be able to have good regeneration, fair regeneration, or uh, poor regeneration throughout the state. And this, is, um, this slide is just all native tree canopy species. So that includes things like American beech. And so you can see in this picture that um, up here at the top where the Adirondacks are, it looks like there's a good potential for native tree canopy regeneration. But when you start looking down in the Southern tier, it gets kind of patchy. You look at the Hudson Valley, for example, and it doesn't look very good at all. There's uh, not a lot of potential for forest regeneration there. And it looks like the Rensselaer Plateau is kind of a blank area. So some areas there weren't, there wasn't enough data maybe to get at that scale. Um, but I'll show you another, uh, another map that can kind of highlight your area. So when they took out um, things like American beech, when they looked at desirable timber species only, so that would include things like maple and oak. And so 
uh, I typically am a wildlife biologist, so my goals typically center around wildlife management, and wildlife conservation. So, uh, but when I look at this, I think the same species that are desirable timber species also are good wildlife food species or just represent the ability to have a diversity of different species in your forest. So um, when you look at you know, just those desirable timber species, then the prognosis got even worse. And there was not, there's not a lot of good potential for regeneration in much of our state. So, um, and then I also wanted to highlight a survey that some of my colleagues at, at Cornell um, conducted in 2009, where they surveyed foresters and they asked them of the stands that you work in, the forest stands, um, how many do you think would have, or you know, highly successful regeneration, moderately successful, marginally successful, or a complete failure? And um, you can see on the left side that statewide, 45% uh, they categorized as marginally successful and 25% were a complete failure. And when they were asked, uh, what they thought the reasons were for that failed forest regeneration, deer browsing came up as the number one reason. And then the second uh, reason after that was interfering vegetation. And that could mean anything from native species that might interfere. And I'll talk a little bit about that in, uh, in a moment, or it could be invasive species um, as well. So deer were identified as uh, top on the list and the Nature Conservancy work also identified deer as a major issue. Uh, DEC recently released a, a new deer management plan for 2021 to 2030, and in there they talked about um, a term coined by um, a colleague of mine in West Virginia, Dave McGill, uh, where he calls it regeneration debt, and that's a condition that predicts the eventual loss of the canopy species that you have because there aren't enough seedlings coming up on the forest floor. So it's either they won't be replaced at all if there's a disturbance because there are no seedlings on the forest floor, or they, the change in species composition would be pretty dramatic if it did happen relative to what's, what's there in the forest canopy now. And so, um, you know, that, that predicts that there could be, if there's regeneration debt, a complete turnover either of species or maybe even a loss of forest habitat itself in those locations. And here's the regeneration debt map in, for New York State that DEC released as part of that plan. And so you can see the Adirondacks um, might have acceptable forest regeneration uh, with over 50% of the stands uh, having no regeneration debt. Um, there are other areas throughout the state, the tan areas uh, that are vulnerable. So um, less than half of them have no regeneration debt, but that doesn't mean that, that none do. That means just only less than half. And uh, less than 25% have moderate to severe debt. And then not acceptable, the areas in blue um, are where things are pretty bad when it comes to forest regeneration. And the ability to regrow a forest if you lose the tree canopy in those areas is, um, is not very good. So white-tailed deer are often referred to as uh, a keystone species, or that that definition gets kind of uh, very specific sometimes, but um, or an engineering species uh, because they they have the ability to change their own habitat and the habitat of other species. And how do they affect the forest? Well, they um, directly browse tree seedlings and other forest plants. I don't know how many times. You know, you go in the woods and you see something that looks like the picture on the right where you know, that ash has been browsed so many times that it doesn't seem to stand much of a chance. Um, the picture on the left, that's a seedling that uh, I planted in, uh, in an open field in a place where we were comparing uh, seedling survival inside and outside an exclosure. And um, that's one of the oak seedlings that we planted, but that was like 12 years later. So you can see that it's still hanging out. It's still there. It's hanging in there, but um, it's been browsed so many times. It's like a very tiny shrub. And in the meantime, uh, there are nice trees growing in the exposure. They were um, doing quite well by that time. By that time. So when deer browse on plants or, um, or seedlings, they can change the forest structure. And you wind up with forests that look like this or similar to this, where you have missing complete layers of vegetation that are missing. So here we have a forest canopy and it's, you know, kind of heavily stocked. There are lots of 
trees there, but there's still sunlight that's coming into the and reaching the forest floor. So you would expect something to be able to grow. And yet those layers, the shrub layer, um, the understory layer are missing um, in large part because deer browsing is very heavy in, in that area. And then deer, not only do they, they actually kill seedlings by feeding on them, but they can also influence the kind of plants that grow in the forest. And here I have a list of high preference species and low preference species. I'm just gonna give a caveat before I go any further and say that what's high preference for deer, There's, there are general, certain, certainly general things that apply across the board. Deer seem to really like maple and they seem to really like ash and they feed on oak pretty heavily. Um, they don't seem to like American beech or hop corn bean and some other species, but I'll, I always hear people say, well, the deer always eat this in my yard or the deer never eat this in my yard. Um, and so there are regional, local and regional differences in preferences. And when deer are hungry enough, they'll eat just about anything. In the lower Hudson Valley, I've been to places where I couldn't find a beech seedling or a beech sprout that was more than a foot tall because there wasn't anything left. So if there's nothing left, then that's what they're gonna be eating. So by eating certain things and uh, not eating others, you're, they're favoring the species that they don't prefer. And then those species have a competitive advantage and can take over in a forest. And that's how you can lose uh, the diversity of species that you have. So I like to show this slide. This is a, a picture of a timber harvest, an area with, that had a timber harvest. Uh, this is in Pennsylvania. And um, the left side of the, the slide and the right side of the slide were treated exactly the same during the harvest. Uh, the only difference is that deer were excluded from the right side um, right after the harvest, whereas they weren't on the left-hand side. And so if you look closely, you can see a variety of different species starting to grow inside the fenced area. And you have that nice shrub layer developing that's going to turn into the, the understory. On the left side, you have grasses and you have ferns, probably hay-scented fern, maybe some New York fern. And if you look, you can see that there's basically no vegetation growing up for the first about six feet of the forest. And that's what's called a, a browse line. And uh, this is something you can notice driving down the road too. I, I do this, I drive down the highway and I look and um, often along the, the field edge and the edge of the forest, you can see that there's, there's nothing. There's not a single twig up to six feet. And that's because oftentimes it's because it's been browsed. So once you get this kind of situation, you have a sea of ferns on the forest floor, that becomes kind of a stable state for that forest. So it's going to take a lot of intentional management to change that um, because the roots of the, right, of the, of the uh, ferns kind of prevent seedlings from becoming established. The ferns block out light. And so you have this, uh, this kind of monoculture of ferns that becomes your forest floor. There was some research done in Pennsylvania um, in the 19, in the, around 1970, uh, they put up some deer exclosures and they, well, they were actually deer enclosures. So the interesting thing about this research is that they uh, way back then thought to create these fenced in areas and put deer in those areas at different densities. So different numbers of deer. And they left them in there for 20 years at that density. And then, um, then they took the, uh, the deer out. And this research and the research I'm gonna show you about birds in, in a couple minutes um, was done um, about 15 years after the deer were removed. So for this, for the tree seedlings, they were looking at um, the tree species diversity within those enclosures in 2005. So um, put up the, the enclosure in 1970, let deer browse for 20 years, 15 years later, went back to see what, what everything looked like. And what they found was um, on the bottom there where the, it has deer per square mile, as you go to the right, that's higher numbers of deer. And you can see the line going down. So as the number of deer increased, the number of, or the tree species diversity decreased. So, um, you know, trees are very long-lived species. So whatever happens on the forest floor today in terms of deer eating seedlings 
shrubs and wildflowers can, uh, but especially uh, trees because they're so, so long lived, um, can affect the forest composition for many, many years down the road. So they leave this legacy effect. There's another research project that was done uh, by Getch et al. Um, in 2011, and they looked at flower and shrub species richness inside a 60-year-old deer exclosure. So this deer exclosure was put up in the 1940s, and then um, they looked at uh, the, the um, wildflowers in uh, sometime late, well, near 2010, 2008, something like that. So you can see um, within the deer exclosure that where it says mean percent cover inside, that's the percent of the ground that was covered by each of these wildflower species. So things like white baneberry and jack in the pulpit, and we'll go down through some that you might be more familiar with, American ginseng, uh, red trillium, painted trillium. And what I want you to take note of is that within that area that was had been um, protected by deer for 60 years, uh, a lot of those species were present. Some only had a trace amount where there's a T that just means there was a trace. But outside of the exposure, a lot of them weren't observed at all, or if they were, it was at very, very low, low levels. So in total, 42% of the ground was covered by these, this diversity of wildflower species inside and on the outside about uh, uh, 0.17%, so not much at all. And then they did the same. They looked at um, some shrubs, um, a, a dogwood, partridge berry, uh, red raspberry, elderberry, and same thing. They were much more abundant and diverse um, inside the exclosure. In fact, it was even more obvious. And then they looked at ferns as well. And a lot of our ferns are just bunch ferns. They don't um, form big, heavy mats like hay scented fern do. So there are some ferns that aren't don't inhibit growth of seedlings at all. You know, we have a Christmas fern, for example, you see it dotting the forest floor, but that doesn't, they don't do anything to prevent uh, seedlings from growing, just those that form, form thick, dense mats. So I just, I circled hay scented fern because you'll see that that's the only thing that was more abundant outside that exposure than it was inside. And their conclusions from their research were, uh, well, this is in North Central Pennsylvania, were that uh, deer browsing had caused about a 60 to 80% decline in the number of species regionally, number of plant species that they were looking at, and that many of these plants also have low dispersal and reproduction rates. So for example, trillium takes many years till it, till it matures and can produce flowers and then seeds. And so uh, these, these plants can't always recover very quickly. And that, so therefore the, the reduced number of species will pers persist for many, many years. Okay, another way that deer affect the forest is that when they browse those native plants, it creates a disturbed condition and something's gonna occupy the site, you know, space of wars, a vacuum, right? So um, often, you know, the, the area is degraded um, and, that allows for things like Japanese barberry or garlic mustard or Japanese stiltgrass to kind of take over the site and um, kind of take over. And then, then it's even harder to reestablish native vegetation without some sort of action. And this can happen also with our native species. Um, I mentioned hay scented fern and I've also mentioned American beech. And these are two native species that can take over an area um, when the deer numbers are high just because their deer don't like to eat them. Um, in addition to affecting the, the plant community, you might expect that deer affect other wildlife as well. And it's most evident with birds. That's what the group that um, most research has been done on. And it makes a lot of sense because birds tend to divide the habitat vertically in a forest. So for example, oven birds would use the forest floor, um, black capped chickadees might use the mid-story, and the scarlet tanager might use the overstory or the tree canopy. So when uh, an entire layer of vegetation is missing from the forest, the habitat for that species is also missing. So you know, when we don't have our understory layer, we don't have our shrub layer, 
many species that depend on that kind of habitat will be affected. And there's been a lot of research done that's, uh, that's shown this. Uh, that same study that I talked about earlier where they had the deer closed in the, uh, the enclosures, they also studied birds in those enclosures um, in, and published this paper in 2008. And what they found was that high, um, higher deer density, densities during the forest stand initiation or when the, the seedlings were, were uh, trying to become established led to a lower canopy foliage density. So there wasn't as much foliage. And then because there weren't many leaves to feed on, there were fewer insects. And with fewer insects, there's also less food for birds overall, and also that missing uh, structural component. There was another study that uh, from New Jersey that looked at uh, species trends from 1980 to 2005, looking at breeding bird survey data, and found a similar thing, that mid-story shrub and ground nesting birds were declining, things like the oven bird, rose-breasted grosbeak, and wood thrush, while during that same time period, canopy nesters were either increasing or stable. And some examples of those are the tufted titmouse, red-bellied woodpecker, or warbling vireo. So um, deer have the ability to also have a long lasting effect on their own habitat as they're feeding on all that, that forage and all the, the woody plant material that they can reach, then that means there's less, less food available for, for deer in the future as well. So it really makes the habitat a poorer quality um, for deer. All right, so what, what can we do? And that's the conundrum, right? What can we do? Well, it's good to, to uh, take some action. Um, you can uh, do start with a visual assessment of your own forest or forest in your community. Um, you can take a walk and uh, see, you know, do you see direct evidence of browsing on tree seedlings? Um, are there spring wildflowers, for example, trillium, which are like candy for deer? Are they present in the forest? And do they produce flowers? This was something that was really eye-opening to me when I started working on AVID. Um, because we were developing the method to also include wildflowers. And um, I'd never really noticed before, uh, but I went out into one of the for forests um, nearby and I was looking for trillium. And we actually, it was in one of our, our research forests and there was an exclosure that had been put up, a very small one years ago for a, a ginseng research project. And it was still up and I looked in there and there were trilliums that were very, very tall, and they had these big showy flowers, and it was really beautiful. And outside the fence, I looked around and I could see trillium, but I saw a lot of very small plants that were just young. Um, I saw a lot that weren't flowering and very few flowers. And only then did I start to realize, oh, I see, now I can see that deer are really impacting this forest stand, um, even more so than when I was looking at tree seedlings. Um, when deer are feeding on wildflowers, uh, they tend to flower less often and less ro robustly because they're putting all their energy back into um, growing the green plant material. So then they're not going to flower and they won't seed and then, you know, then the population can be reduced. And then another thing you want to look at is, is there a variety of tree seedling types present? And are any of them able to grow beyond five feet tall, which is getting to be the height at which deer might not reach them? So those are some things to look for when you're out walking around in your woods. You can collect information on your land and monitor over time to see if the conditions are changing. Um, the benefits of that are is that you're getting an up close look at your land on a yearly basis. You go out and you're intentionally looking for signs. And it's a way to know if deer are preventing you from growing or regenerating a new forest in the future or limiting the diversity that you might have in your forest. And so toward that end, um, my colleagues and I at Cornell, Paul Curtis and Peter Smallage and I uh, worked with some folks at SUNY ESF and uh, were funded by DEC to create this method for assessing vegetation impacts from deer. And so it's basically just a rapid assess assessment method to evaluate deer impacts to forest vegetation. 
And we designed it for landowners, for hunters, for foresters, land managers, land trust personnel, and also volunteers for, uh, for organizations. Uh, we wanted to, it to be something that anybody could do that wouldn't take too much time. It does take a little bit of an investment, but hopefully not too much. And the purpose or the idea is to collect information about wildflowers or tree and shrubs seedlings on your land, or again, land in your community or land of a client, for example, if you're a forester. And why would you want to do it? Well, again, you want to maybe want to learn a little bit more about the ecology of your land. You might want to learn to identify some spring wildflower or tree seedlings, and you don't have to identify much. It helps to, for you to be able to get a bigger picture, but to uh, to be able to participate in AVID, you really only have to learn to identify one tree, seed, tree seedling, and uh, you can do that while the leaves are on, and so um, it's really not too daunting a task if you're not already familiar with um, tree, tree identification. Um, it can help you develop an eye for recognizing key signs of deer impacts to your woods. As I mentioned, I mean, I've been working in this field for a long time, but I still, when I was looking for something different, I, it really did open my eye. I, I look for different things now when I go into the forest. Um, and it can help document the health of New York forests and track change over time, contributing to a statewide effort with uh, many, many other volunteers. So I just wanted to give the in a nutshell, what is AVID? And basically it's going out into the forest, finding out which species are there and are abundant enough that you can find 25 to 30 seedlings. Um, you can also use wildflowers, but I'll talk about some of the pitfalls of that in a moment. And uh, we ask you to measure them one time a year for three years. So four measurements, the initial one, one year later, one year after that, and one the year after that. And three years gives us enough time to get a kind of a trajectory of, you know, how are your seedlings growing or are they growing? So the first step is, uh, you know, you go out and you choose a stand in your forest. And a stand is really um, a, an area with distinctly different conditions. So you might have a hemlock stand, an oak pine forest, northern hardwood forest. So thinking of it just like a farmer's field, you have a pumpkin field, you have a corn field. Um, and you can select one or more stands. If you want to monitor more than one, um, we'd be happy to have you do that. And there are, a lot, there are benefits to that too, to see you know, which are the different stands that are being um, affected uh, more or less than others. And there are things that um, you want to avoid. So steep slopes aren't the best place to monitor. First of all, it's um, you know, difficult to access, but also deer might have a harder time accessing it. And so the impacts might, you know, the measurements that you get might not be representative of the rest of your stand. Um, where the rock cover is really heavy, you wanna avoid those areas because there's gonna be fewer seedlings or the option for fewer seedlings. Um, you wanna avoid areas where ferns and grass and invasive species cover a lot of the site because um, if they do, then probably you're not gonna find many many seedlings or their growth might be inhibited by, by those other plant species. And then you wanna do some general reconnaissance. So you've chosen your stand, you've got in the general area that you think you wanna work in. And then you wanna just take a little walk around and look at the seedlings that are growing on your site. What's the most abundant? And really just start out with, you know, what, what do they look like? What, I see that one's the same as that one and there are a lot of them then you can identify what the species is and choose that species um, to monitor. You can choose to monitor more than one species if you'd like. Um, that's definitely possible. And we've had people do that, especially if you choose one species that deer really like. So say you have a lot of sugar maple seedlings, um, you can choose sugar maple, and then maybe you have something else like beech that deer don't like as much. And that's interesting because it gives you a picture of, um, okay, so say you just went out and measured beech, that would tell you, okay, things that deer don't like are growing well here. Um, but what about the things that deer do like? So if you have the maple and the beech, it kinds of, or something that deer do like and don't like, it gives you a clearer picture of, what, of what's going on. And then you can also uh, look at wildflower species. Are the target species present? And if so, where? Um, there are a number of species that we've included in the protocol 
trillium, for example, um, Indian cucumber root, uh, there are a few of them. The seedling method is much easier. <laughs> um, seedlings stay in one place, and if they are browsed or if they die, you can usually you know, find them still. Uh, the tags stay on them well. Um, for wildflowers, you have to kind of put the tag in the ground next to the wildflower, and then the wildflower doesn't always pop up at the exact same spot. So if you have a few that are close together and you've tagged them, you might be confused as to which one was which last year. So they can be a little more challenging, um, but it, it can still be helpful overall when you're looking at the overall heights or an average height of the wildflowers that you've tagged um, for knowing you know, how well they're doing. But overall, I'd say that the seedling method is easier and um, the data may be more meaningful. And the other thing about uh, wildflowers is that, you know, a lot of the wildflowers are blooming in the spring and they only persist until maybe June or July, and then they start to kind of sag over. So um, they're a little bit more uh, time sensitive to measure, whereas woody seedlings, you know, trees or even shrubs, um, you, could, you could theoretically monitor them any time of year, but, um, you know, optimally, and it makes it easier to monitor them while they have leaves. So that would be, you know, anytime starting late May to uh, the end of September. So for seedlings, you have a lot more uh, potential in terms of uh, when you can go out and measure. We do ask that you measure the within a couple of weeks of the time that you first do your first measurement. And it doesn't have to be exactly two weeks, but um, it's good to have it be as close to one exact year apart as possible. So the next step is to set up your monitoring plot. So within that stand you've chosen, you've chosen which species you want to monitor. Um, we recommend setting up four to six plots and trying to capture within those plots um, five to eight seedlings of the same species. So you basically find where you know you can capture that many seedlings and you make the center of your plot and a point where you're going to capture you know, five to eight seedlings of that species. Um, the, we ask that the plot centers be at least 25 feet apart. And that's really the reason for this is just trying to spread it out across the, the forest a little bit. If you happen to set up just one plot with 25 to 30 species, and it happens to be right next to a deer trail, you might not be getting what's representative of the whole area versus, or vice versa. It could be an area that deer just don't happen to wander through very often and things may not be browsed. And um, so you might not get it, you know, it might be skewed toward less browsing. So by kind of spreading the plots out, you might get a better picture of what's happening. So then, um, then it's time to mark and measure the seedlings. And if you have six plots, you would have five seedlings in each. Um, if you have fewer than six plots, you would have more species, more seedlings for each. 25 is really the minimum number we're shooting for. I always like to tag 30 because inevitably, some tags will come off or something will happen and you'll lose some, some seedlings will die. So to set up the plot, this is what it looks like. Um, we have some PVC pipe that we've been using just like one inch diameter. We paint it orange on the top and cut it just uh, like 18 inches high. Um, use that as a plot center. I use, um, you can use wooden stakes for the outside. Um, Stakes, which are here at the ends here, um, or you can use, I use pin flags. So they're easy to, to get and um, they're very inexpensive. Uh, you could also use a wooden stake for your plot center. But basically it's a six foot radius plot. And then we put um, the stakes in at each cardinal direction. So north, south, east, and west. And that just helps us to keep track of where the seedlings are. So as we tag the seedlings, we record which quadrant they're in. Then when we go back to remeasure, we know exactly where to look for that, that tag number. And uh, you know, in a forest that's not very thick, that's not really, a, it's not too hard to find, uh, refine your seedlings in a plot of that size. But if you just um, did a timber harvest, for example, and the seedlings are fresh and new and you go in one year and then you come back the next year and there's profuse growth in there, it can be harder, a little bit harder to find. So then within that plot, um, we ask you to record canopy cover of the trees up above, the ground cover, 
what the dominant species are, just a little bit of background information. And then tag and measure uh, the height of those individual species, um, those individual seedlings. So uh, we have tags that are pre-printed, these yellow tags here. Uh, we have thousands of them. So if anybody who's on tonight is interested and you want to put in plots, if you email me, I can send you some. Um, as long as you're pretty certain that you're going to actually put them in um, this year, then we can do that. And they're really handy. They're like, you know, like bread ties. You just wrap them around the, the stem of the seedling and you pull it pretty tight, not super tight. You don't want to um, trap moisture in there or inhibit the growth in any way. Um, but they stay on pretty well. Shorter seedlings, sometimes animals will brush by and um, they can come off. But most of the time, as long as you keep it pretty low to the ground, they, uh, they stay on pretty well. And then you just measure the height, um, you know, take a meter stick out or a yardstick, and you measure the height from the base of the stem to the top of the newest woody growth. So here I'm showing that point right there for this yellow poplar. Um, we don't do to the end of the leaf, the tallest leaf. Um, because, you know, leaves come out in different directions every year. So just because it's up here this year doesn't mean it won't be down here next year. So we look at the top of the newest woody growth here at the end um, for a more standard representation. Okay, and the, the last thing I want to point out is that we also measure the natural height rather than, than it, so if a seedling is kind of leaning over, we don't pick it up and stand it up to be its tallest. Um, we just leave it where it is. So that's basically the, the height at which deer would encounter it. And then sometimes when we were doing the initial research for this and, um, and others too, other landowners have, have um, done this, we like to put up some small deer exclosures, even if it's just very simple with plastic netting around a few trees or something, um, around some areas where there's the same seedling species present and establish a couple of plots or, or at least, you know, maybe you put up a small exclosure and you do all 25 in there or two exclosures and you do 15 and 15. But um, by having some extras within a deer exclosure, it can show you the difference between inside and outside for your land and give you an idea of what, you know, what you might expect in the absence of deer browsing or in the absence of heavy deer browsing. Not, we're not going for no deer browsing. Um, yeah. Um, to collect the AVID data, we have paper data sheets and they're available on our website, aviddeer.com. And um, also there's an AVID manual there. Um, there's information, uh, some background information, all the data sheets. Uh, there's some information that you record about the site itself, the ownership, and then there's this plot, um, this plot sheet where you add a little extra information, you know, the percent canopy closure and that kind of thing. And then you just write down the species and the tag number and you do the measurement and that's that's it for the first year. And then in future years, you just go back and remeasure. So the initial investment of setting up the plots takes the longest time, but after that, revisiting and remeasuring really doesn't take much time at all. Okay, and this is what the website looks like when you enter. You can sign up, um, you know, uh, create a username and password. Uh, again, access the, the user guides and all kinds of information. And then, oh, it, it doesn't show it in there. But um, basically, when you when you're using uh, the paper data sheets, then there's a place to go in and enter the data that you collect on the website, and that's how it becomes part of the larger database. Um, and there's some great feedback that you can get there. So as soon as you enter your data, it will graph it for you. You can compare it to other uh, sites in your region. And so there's going to be some, some nice feedback to let you know, um, you know, how things are doing in your forest relative to others. And uh, it's a good site just to, uh, to collect all the data. And that's how the data become useful as part of this project. We also have smartphone apps that were developed both for Android and for Apple, and they're working uh, quite well. 
Um, the a lot of people. So I personally, I am more comfortable with paper data sheets and then typing it into the web afterward. But a lot of younger people really um, are very comfortable using tech outdoors. So um, the um, the smartphone apps work very well. And the benefit of those is that um, the GPS location of the plots is collected automatically um, versus um, if you're putting them in yourself, then you have to collect the, the location of the plots yourself. Um, so it's like at least one more step that you don't have to worry about. Um, the one downside is if you're in a place where you don't have cell reception, it of course it can't upload it uh, right away. So you have to go, once you are in an area with cell reception, you have to open it back up and then um, there's just a button that you press. It'll tell you that you have data that hasn't been uploaded yet. And you just press that and then it will upload automatically. So that saves you um, the time of having to go and enter it manually in the website. So yeah, here's some of the things. You know, you want to create a new plot. You type the number one, plot one. The ground and shrub cover might be 20 to 29%, sub canopy. Closure there is 40 to 49. The canopy closure is 50 to 59. Is the plot enclosed or protected from deer? In this case, the answer was no. Um, and if so, how many growing seasons? Well, it's not relevant because there wasn't one. Um, you type, you know, your name. There is an area, a place for basal area and um, so a couple of other items, but those aren't required. But uh, if you're a forester, um, you might want to fill that out if it's information that you want to collect. All right, and then how long should you collect data? And I think I already mentioned that uh, once a year within two weeks of the initial uh, date that you measured the, the prior year, uh, four times the minimum to be able to see a change. And you can also say if you work for an organization or a nonprofit, you can share data collection responsibilities with others. So we do have the option um, on the website for more than one person to be able to, from an organization, to be able to access um, the data online. That way, if you have, um, you know, some turnover year to year, say you have summer interns, you can give them access to your sites and they can enter the data, um, though we, you would need somebody in your organization that's going to be there long term to be able to, to access it. So um, you um, are measuring and the deer impacts are substantial. So now what? Well, you know, we all know that there are, you know, limited options for what you can do. I mean, the most effective is to reduce deer numbers when possible and, and especially before you have a timber harvest so that you can give those seedlings that are on the ground the best possible advantage um, once you let the sunlight in. Uh, you can fence to exclude deer and even small exclusions can be beneficial. But you know, of course, it's quite can be quite expensive to fence large acreage, um, and you can leave a good amount of woody material after a, following a timber harvest on the ground. Um, Steve Morelli and I have been doing some research over the years, looking at the amount of woody material that's left on the forest floor and the effects on a, a lot of different um, factors. But one of them is deer browse, and so this picture here shows our intern Ryan. Um, Right next to a pile of tops, we had the logger leave um, the tops in the crisscrosses of two or three trees. And um, you can see that there's browsing inside into that pile about as wide as a deer's neck is long. And so you can kind of see it's kind of gradually the seedling um, height increases until it gets into the middle there where they couldn't access. So. You know, if you have enough wood and it's big enough and it doesn't decay too quickly, then um, having treetops on the forest floor can be helpful to help regenerate species or seedlings. Um, if the deer population is really high or the wood isn't enough to, you know, provide a physical barrier, then it may not be as helpful. And then you can also keep monitoring and submitting data. Um, so DEC uh, really wanted this to be developed because they there's not a lot of detailed information on the ground across the state showing deer impacts in various locations. And it's uh, the impacts to forests are something that they'd like to consider, or they do consider um, when uh, establishing deer management goals. 
but there's no hard data. So what they're hoping is that with more data on the ground, they'll have a finer resolution and a better understanding of where regeneration is able to happen and, and where it's more difficult. So success looks like um, seeing changes on the ground, like wildflowers appearing, they're taller, they're flowering more often. If you have an exclosure outside the fenced areas begin to look like the inside and seedlings, especially those preferred by deer um, can grow past the height that deer can reach. To uh, test this method and make sure that it was effective, we put in our own plots in various locations across the state um, inside exposures and outside, and we uh, published that in the uh, Forest Ecology and Journal of Forest Ecology and Management in 2021. We published those results, and uh, there's the title of that paper. And uh, I just wanted to show you one table from that paper. This is our seedling growth results. So um, we didn't have, you know, we had sugar maple we were monitoring at what's that, like five sites. We had red oak we were monitoring at four sites, red maple at two, white ash at two, and black cherry at two. And I just wanted to point out that if you look at the column inside the fence, those were the, uh, that was the percent growth in, of the seedlings inside the fence. And then to the right is outside the fence. And to the far right is the difference. And so you'll see that there was pretty decent growth inside the fence for, for a lot of these uh, species at a lot of the sites, not, not all. It was very odd that black cherry didn't seem to grow much inside or outside um, at the two sites where we were monitoring it. That was kind of, um, left me kind of baffled. But um, for everything else, um, it grew significantly more out, inside than outside. So that was really testing our method. Is our method sensitive enough, this AVID method, sensitive enough to detect um, to detect the ch a difference um, in deer browsing levels? And it was. So AVID um, is effective for detecting and documenting deer impacts. It's a more sensitive site-specific measurement than the, the general impact modeling that was being done, and it'll provide more valuable local information. The only other deer browse data that's collected statewide is the forest inventory analysis data that the Forest Service collects, I think, every five years, maybe. And so it's very scattered about. It's, there's not a lot of it, and it's again, it's only done every five years. Um, and then as AVID data become available, um, hopefully DEC will be able to use them to inform their decisions for setting deer population trajectories. Um, our, if you're interested in establishing AVID plots, our partners in Minnesota, um, there were some folks in Minnesota who were very interested in using this method as well, and they have adopted it and are using it in their state. And they have a couple of really good videos that I could put in the chat box maybe. Um, for how to set up the plots and how to measure seedlings. So it's kind of, it's good to see them actually doing it live and in action in person. And if you have any questions at any time, I mean, tonight for sure, um, but anytime afterward, or if you're interested in seedling tags or you want some kind of follow-up, um, please feel free to, to reach out and I'll do my best to answer your question. Thank you, Christy. That was great. Thanks. If anyone has any questions, just pop them in the chat. Well, I have a question. Um, how many of the stands are on private property versus on conserved land like we have at the RPA? Okay, um, that's a good question. I don't, I don't have a good sense for exactly. Um, we definitely have some on private lands. Um, the Nature Conservancy has put a lot in on their lands. Um, Mohawk Reserve has done a lot on theirs. And then, um, I don't know, maybe 50-50? 
And we have a quite, quite a few. Um, so through the Master Naturalist Volunteer Program, some of the volunteers have um, paired up with organizations and are um, establishing plots on lands of, of not-for-profits um, and, and uh, collecting the data. So there are definitely quite a few master naturalists who are involved in that, um, but also landowners, just forest landowners. Great, thanks. And if, also, if anybody in the chat box, even if you wanted to, um, if you are oh, interested yeah. in seedlings. Okay. Yeah, we just had a bunch of questions come in. Okay. Okay. All right, here's the first one. Any idea what ideal density of deer per square acre would be and how far we are from that ideal state? Uh oh. I think looks we like might have lost her. Yeah, looks like we might have lost Christy temporarily. Um, speaking for myself, I have no idea what the answer to that question is. So I think we better wait till. <laughs> unless you want to guess, Tanya, I think we'd better wait till Christy comes. No back. idea. I I have the urge to fence in a large portion of land now. <laughs> right. Um, I've noticed just lots of white pine. There's so many little white pine, but little else. We'll have to look more closely. While we're waiting, is there anybody here on the um, on the meeting who has participated in the AVID program or the AVID program in the past? I'm just curious if you want to mention it in the chat. Um, is RPA considering participating? I think we've considered participating in different places in, in a small way in the past. We had a, um, we actually had an intern um, in the spring of 2020. We had an intern who has her, her internship project was going to do um, some small avid plots at Post and Kill Community Forest, and then COVID happened, and um, she she was a local college student. She got sent home, and so we had to switch switch plans. So anyway, Christy's back, and I'll hand things back to Danya and Christy. Well, thank you. Christy. Sorry about that. I got booted off. Um, <laughs> So I, I heard the question. Did you hear the question about, about the ideal density of the deer yes. per square area? Yes. So um, that's a really great question. And it's one that people ask often. And I would say um, the point that we've come to before, it used to be, you know, trying to develop methods for figuring out how many deer we had. Um, you know, we use pellet counts and we use browse counts and we use all kinds of, we use spotlighting and all kinds of methods to try to figure out how many deer. But the bottom line is it doesn't matter how many deer we have. It matters what impact they're having and whether or not we can, um, we can accomplish the goals that we have with that many deer. So some areas, for example, the Catskills, maybe lower fertility soils and trees don't grow very quickly. So in an area like the Catskills, um, you can support fewer deer than you could support somewhere you know, where the soils might be better and tree growth might be faster. Um, so it doesn't matter so much how many deer as, you know, are you able to regrow a forest? Because if you can't, then it doesn't really matter, you know, if it's 20 or 10 or 40. Um, what matters is at what point, when have you gotten to the point where you can grow a new forest or, um, whatever your goals might be for your land. So we've, we've come to a, like a more of an, um, kind of more of an impact oriented assessment of, you know, are there too many deer or not, uh, rather than, um, looking at a target number of deer per square mile. 
That's that makes sense. And this is kind of related. Has the DEC modified their hunting limits based on AVID data? Um, I would say no, not yet, because we we started developing this before um, uh, before COVID, and then COVID hit and kind of put things kind of at a standstill in terms of trainings for people and everything. So we've really just gotten back up and are fully in swing now with different trainings um, and getting people getting people involved. So there's there's not enough data yet. So we're hoping though that we're going to be you know generating. Um, generating an update as soon that they, they will be able to use that. And that reminds me too, that if there's any interest in a regional on-site training, I'd be willing to come and do a, you know, an, an in-person training out in the woods. And what I usually do for that is we go to a site and everybody who participates, um, you know, we break up into little groups and we actually establish plots on that site so that you know, there's all right, there's one site up and running that can be monitored in the future, but it's also so much uh, it's so much better to actually do it as a group and work through the you know the issues that you have and the questions that come up. And um, it can be really helpful, I think, for jump starting your own avid experience. That's a great offer. Thank you. Can you comment on the benefits of increased deer hunting? Can I comment on the benefits of increased deer hunting? Um, well, I suppose if there is more deer hunting and more deer killed, then uh, in areas where you know deer are having um, significant impacts on the um, biodiversity and, and forest health, then that would help to, to alleviate that some. I have a question. You mentioned there was a um, X, what's it called? It's not an enclosure, an exclosure that was 60 years old. Is that around the time that um, there was an awareness of the impact that deer were having, like, you know, back then, or was it before then? How long have we understood that we're infringing upon, you know, that we're changing the environment, that humans are moving into areas, and now there's more deer, and, you know, just and measured that? Yeah, that, that's a really good question because um, I think that early on, there wouldn't have been, I don't think people would have been thinking that. I don't know what the what it was put up for, if it was intentionally to keep deer out or if it just happened to be a solid fence that was put up for some other purpose, You know, kind of like the one that we had at our Arnott Forest, it was for something else and that just happened to keep deer out. So that's a really good question because, you know, at the beginning of the 1900s, you know, when a lot of forests had been cleared wholesale, either for agriculture or, you know, just all the timber was removed uh, with no eye toward regenerating forests. Um, you know, there weren't, you know, deer populations also crashed after that. And then you had, you know, deer reintroductions in different states happening. So I think that would have been a little early on in our um concerns for for too many deer but um but that's a really good question i'm going to go back and read that paper and see if they have any more information on why that was that was uh, put up thank you christy so we're right at the top of the hour i don't see any more questions oh wait here's one my father installed fencing for farmers for years. I understood deer can easily jump fences and unless they are very high or installed at an angle as an effective deer fence, they have little effect. Is that true? Um, well, deer are very persistent. And yes, eight, I mean, a, a fence that's high enough to keep deer out is usually thought of as an eight foot fence. Um, but that's if it's a large area. If you have a very small area, you could do little clusters. And, you know, for the purpose of avid plots, you could do something small. And it wouldn't have to be as high because if there's something, you know, deer won't have much reason to jump into a small enclosure if they have a lot of food available outside to them. So a smaller enclosure, a smaller height fence can work in really small areas. In larger areas, though, they they can go over if it's not eight feet tall. You also have in the woods, you have trees falling on fences, so you have to do you know very regular maintenance and monitoring of your fences. They also will push under a fence, 
And so, you know, and, and the forest floor is not flat. So there's a lot of humps and bumps. So there has to be a lot of attention paid to establishing the fence so that the fence goes all the way to the ground and then maybe laying logs along the bottom. So yes, maintaining fences and especially um, in a forested area can, can be very challenging. Great. Well, I just want to thank everyone for joining us. I extend my gratitude and thanks to Christy. It's been really educational. And uh, we hope to see all of you next month again. Have a good evening. Thank you, everyone. Bye.